Hello, Crossroad family and friends. Welcome. Please see the following announcements. Family, the date for the annual Harvest Fest is set for Saturday, October 29th from 12 to 4 p.m. We look forward to having a great time together with carnival rides, games, and plenty of food. All are welcome. It will be a blast. Covenant Glory will resume September 7th at 9.30 a.m. via teleconference. If you are interested in joining us, please call 302-741-2455 for details. Join us for intercessory prayer this and every Saturday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. The theme scripture for August is 2 Thessalonians 3.3. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. We look forward to seeing you for one hour of powerful prayer. If you are ready to tackle your debt and take control of your finances, we can help. Take advantage of a free membership to Ramsey Plus and Financial Peace University. These will be the last sessions to be offered this year. The two sessions are as follows. Session 1, September 13th to November 8th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. with an interest meeting to be held on September 6th. Session 2, September 17th to November 12th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. The interest meeting will be held on September 10th. This free resource offers a variety of proven financial tools that have helped members just like you and me to take control of our financial future. For more information, please contact Terry Rhodes Williams. Delaware. Virginia and surrounding areas. Mark your calendars for Saturday, October the 8th as Portals of Glory Productions presents the live recording of Elder Winfred Duffy at Crossroad Christian Church of Dover, Delaware. Save the day. So you clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you clean me up inside. So you clean me up inside. You, you thought, thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed. So you sacrificed your life so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could tell. Yeah. 
part as we clap our hands. I need you to find yourself in the song. I see y'all moving. Y'all look good. So if you're a soprano, if you're an alto, if you're a tenor, I need you to find your part and lift your voice as loud as you can. Is that all right? Come on, sopranos. Come on, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. It says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, for the rest of my life. Altos. Day. Yes. That sounds good. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes. for the rest of my life. Come on, tell us. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For the rest of my day. Hey, yes. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For the rest of my day. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For the rest of my day. Yes. Say yes, Lord. Soprano. All right, come on, Sopranos. Help us see. Say yes. Yes. Come on, Sopranos. Who y'all at? Yes, Lord, for the rest of my day. Say yes. Yes. If you can breathe through it, you can sing through it. Come on. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, for the rest of my day. All right, they did okay, but where the altos at? <laughs> altos, y'all think y'all can sing it louder? Come on, altos. Say yes. Yes, Lord, say. Yes, Lord, for the rest of my Out here, let me hear you say. Yes. Oh, they sound good, don't they? <laughs> say, yes, Lord, say. That was good, y'all give them a hand. I know the tenors, whether you're male or female. I know y'all can help them. Come on, say yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, for the rest of my day. You say. small things in life that we take for granted are actually very big. Um, so in high school, we used to, to have an exercise to where one person would blindfold another person, and you would have to be blind for the whole day. Anybody ever do that or for the whole school year? Anybody raise your hand if, you, if you've done that. But if you've never been blinded, then you don't, you don't know how it is to be blind, right? We drove ourselves here this morning, got in the car, secondhand, and just were able to drive. I witnessed my grandmother in the hospital on a ventilator because she couldn't breathe on her own. And when they took her off the oxygen, she was helpless. As me, and so we're sitting here, we're breathing right now. Effortless. Hearing. How important is our, our hearing? If you were to wake up tomorrow, you couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear anyone tell you that they loved you. You couldn't see them say that I love you. You couldn't speak to them. Then you wouldn't take it for granted once if it were taken away and give it back. There's a story in the Bible of a blind man who heard Jesus was coming to town. 
And I didn't really understand this song because we hear the songs, chasing after you, God, I'm chasing after you, I'm running after you. But sometimes you just have to sit and wait once you hear that Jesus is coming. So I had to sit in posture and say, you know what, God, I'm waiting. And while I'm waiting, I'm looking around and being appreciative. I know you're coming. I know my blessings are coming. I know what you have in store for me, but I don't always have to be on the move and so quick to do things. But sometimes that posture is just waiting. Somebody says, I don't mind waiting. Just say, I don't mind waiting. God, I won't be impatient. I won't chase after those things in before time that I know I'm supposed to get, but I won't do it before time, right? So the song just says, it says, don't mind waiting I don't mind waiting on you say I don't mind waiting don't mind waiting I don't mind waiting on you so while we're sitting, can we stand? And just lift your hands wherever you are. And just begin to just think about how good it is to lift your hands and how thankful you have the movement of your limbs. How you have the activities and the functions of your mind. How your heart beats without you telling it to beat. When you're hurt, your body automatically just heals itself. God, I thank you. So let's fill this atmosphere. Let's fill this room. Let's fill it with praise and adoration. As we begin to lift our voices, everybody say, I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind. I don't mind waiting. On you, you can say that. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. On you, say that again. That sounds good. I don't mind waiting. Thank you, Jesus. I don't mind. Say again, I don't mind. Oh, we will wait, we will wait, we will wait on you, Lord. I don't mind waiting on you. Lord, I need you, everybody. Lord, I need you. Yes, I need you. a love song to him, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Yes, I need you. Yes, I need you. All together, Zion, lift your voice and say, Jesus. The name that has a 
name above all names. Concerning the tithe giving last week, we talked about the history of the tithe and how uh, um, you know it's was, it was birthed up with with uh, Abram and Melchizedek realizing that Jesus Christ was Melchizedek, and our tithe is a form of worship. This week we're going to talk about so that's before the law, and you know our brother did such a great job earlier of saying, hey, the tithe came before the law; it was in the law, so it has to be after the law. So, uh, um, you know, today we're going to show why was it introduced to the law, how it was introduced to the law, and, and kind of go through that space. And then next week we're going to go into, you know, the tithe after the law, because it is written in the word after the law. So we're going to see what is this whole thing about. Some, before we even get started, a couple cool things that we're going to do uh, today. If you get your, uh, um, if you're writing whatever device you want to write this down. Um, we're gonna have a phone number that you can text your questions to. So I know that you know I speak at New York Jamaican speed, and um, you know so sometimes you have to go back, slow down to YouTube to like 0.75 to uh, to understand it in Delaware speak. But 
I, I know that happens. So if there's questions as we're going through the scriptures, because we're going to hit a lot of scriptures, we want you guys to be able to ask questions, whether it's on last week. You can text during the service um, as well. And then either next week or Pastor and I are going to have a separate time, but all we're going to do is just answer those questions. Cool? So there's going to be no confusion concerning the word in which we hear. So the number is actually up here. So you see it's 302. 257-2141, and this also goes to our virtual audience as well, those who are all over the world receiving um, the word. You can text your questions in here, as well as you can uh, um, text, you can email for those non-texters. You can email cccdover3, don't forget the three, because it won't come to us. So cccdover3 at gmail.com, cool? Thank you so much. So a quick backdrop before we kind of um, get into the word and pray real quick. Um, what's going on? The children of Israel now has left. Um, they're in the promised land. So, you know, the story is they, they go to Egypt. They're in slavery for 400 years. Moses meets God, 10 commandments, you know, 10 plagues, the whole gambit. And now they're in um, the, the, the wilderness, but they're about to leave the wilderness. They're about to go into this promised land that God promised them. So uh, um, David, uh, not David, Moses now in Deuteronomy starts listing out a series of things. If you go from Deuteronomy 1 all the way to 26, where we're going to be, he starts going through a series of instructions or ideas to help them understand now they're going into this new place. You know, how should they behave? So, you know, in the first section, he says, you know, when you get into the land of the living, this promised land, don't forget God. This is all before we get to where we're going to be. He says, don't forget God. He says, you know, also, secondly, he says, you're going to see a, a remnant. A remnant means like a leftover, like uh, it's like the, the, you can see that there's a remnant of the musicians, right? We see equipment all over the place. There's stuff that's evidence that it existed. There's this remnant. So you're going to see the remnant of the pagan nations. And he says, when you do that, I want you to dismantle their gods, break down their gods. He says, don't allow their culture to transform you, but be transformed people. Now, we know later um, Paul says that to the Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But he says to them, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be that way. He says, don't do what they do because there's going to be some people there still. See, when they went into the promised land, it's not like all the Canaanites just broke out. They were still there. They had to intermingle. God has called us to be in the world, just not of the world. You, you know, we're supposed to be like a fish in water, that concept, right? Fish goes into water. But what do you have to put on your fish for it to taste good? Thank you for participating. Salt, right? So uh, they swim around in salt water, but when you take them out, they got to be salted. Why? Because they're in the ocean, but the ocean's not in them. And so similarly, we are supposed to be in the world, uh, but the world should not be in us. We should not be of the world, right? So he says, don't practice what they practice. Don't do what they do. Don't worship what they worship. He says, live a transformed life before God. Don't let their culture transform you. And that's a really important concept to understand as we start thinking about the tithe and everything concerning the Lord, because today that's the big challenge that we see, right? That there, there's, we live in this world, and many times, even in the household of faith over the fa past five to seven years, you've seen how the, the household of faith has taken on the cloak of the world, the, the cloak of culture. But God didn't call us to be people of culture. He called us to be people of kingdom. Yeah. You know, so it's a really important thing. Thirdly, he says that we're going to be a new nation, right? These, these, are, these are scattered people without an identity. They were slaves. They, they, you know, the system of slavery, we understand since American slavery, but, you know, as slaves, they didn't, they didn't, like, correlate or congregate together as one people. So now they're going to have some pride. They're going to have their own nation. They're going to be, the, you know, this thing. So he says, hey, we're going to put together some laws, these civil laws, to help them honor God and understand what that is and also respect their fellow man. They're going to be responsible for some things in here. You know, even so much so that, um, and you can see how grace and the, and the spirit of Jesus was woven all through the scriptures because when they created this law system, this legal system for them, they set aside a city called the city of refuge. So if you committed a crime and maybe you didn't plan on, you know, um, doing, it was maybe, you know, something that, you, you know, wasn't of malicious intent, you can run to the city of refuge and receive safety. Yeah. We know that's a, you know, a, a typology of who Jesus is. He's our city of refuge. And if you're a sinner here today, you can run to the city. His name is Jesus Christ. You can come to him and receive safety. You receive protection from your sin and eternal life. So it's an amazing thing. So now he's gone through those things, and now we're in Deuteronomy, um, you know, 26 and, and um, where we are. So we're going to read through it real quick, verses 1 through 13, and then we're going to pray and kind of dig it out. So 
Deuteronomy 26, um, where verse 1, he says, And it shall be when you come into the land, which the Lord your God has given you as inheritance, that you possess it and dwell in it. You shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which shall be from your land um, that the Lord your God has given you, and put it in baskets and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go into um, one... Uh, and you shall go to the, one, to the one who is a priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the country with the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the baskets out of your hand and set aside before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, my father was a Syrian, but about to perish. And he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and afflicted us and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord our God, uh, 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 the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt to the, with his mighty hand, with the outstretched arm, with great terror, with signs and wonders. He, verse 9, he has brought us to this place which you have given us this land, land flowing milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought, first, brought um, the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have, have given me. Then you shall set aside, you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So, so you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord has given us, um, has given to me to you and your house, and you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. Then you have, when you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may be they may eat within their gates and be filled. And then verse 13, as we finish up here, he says, Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house. And also I have given it to them, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word today, Lord. I thank you for those who are here with us, we know that we're consistently in front of a mixed multitude, those who know you and have an intimate relationship, those who know of you, those who may not even know of you, those who once had an intimate relationship but not so much right now. We just thank you that people are able to hear specifically your word. I thank you that people are delivered from the bondage sometimes the world and the church have put on us concerning finances and money, and I thank you that we're able to worship you consistently according to your word. Lord, allow me to decrease always and completely that they can hear you in this message concerning giving. We thank you that this is not even a message about money as much as it's a message about worship, and we choose to worship you because you're worthy and you're king of all. We glorify you and magnify you in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's say there's a story, right? You know, the story of this, um, this person is starving hungry, and someone comes along and gives him 10 um, loaves of bread. All right, are they grateful? Okay, I'm going to help you guys out. In my house, in my culture, we do something called forced family fun. That means that everybody has to participate. So as long as you got lips, when I ask questions, I need answers, because I don't ask any rhetorical questions today. Cool? Let's try it again. Cool? Yeah, I want to get you guys out on time, so if you participate, it goes faster. You know what I mean? So thank you so much. So uh, are they grateful? Thank you. So if I gave you 10 loaves of bread, you're starving, and I say, hey, can you give me one back? Would you be willing to do it? Yeah. Absolutely. You're like, yeah, not a problem. Well, that's what God does with the tithe. He gives you the full portion. And he says, let me just get one-tenth back. Now, some people go, well, if God just wanted you to have nine, why not just give you nine and not stress out about this whole 1% back or 10% back business? And the reason why is because if he gives you nine, you're not able to give one back and still have nine. You know, so when you give back, is your ability to say thank you. You, you, you know, because if you just talk all 10 and went, you, you didn't have that opportunity to say thank you. So it's your opportunity to say thank you. You also set in motion a series of laws that are tied to givers only. 
it's kind of like a, um, there's laws that are tied to pilots only. There's laws that are tied to police officers only. Laws tied to military only. There's laws that are tied to everyone, right? If anybody walks across this thing and doesn't take the step down, they're going to fall down, right? It's called gravity. So, so you get to set in, 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 in motion things like the law of reciprocity. If you give, it'll be given back unto you. Right? You can press, you can give, and it'll give, you'll get back. You get all these benefits, but understand, you didn't have anything. You were hungry, starving, and you didn't have a loaf of bread. And in our life, we didn't have resources, so he says, hey, I'm going to give you, I'm going to supply your need, and from it now you can set that aside. Amen? So that's this idea that you know, God wants us to worship him and show that gratefulness in there. So this is exactly um, what God is doing with the Israelites. He's saying to them, when you come into the promised land, please remember um, that you are because of me. Right? You have these flocks, these vineyards because of me. You have your living and your resources because of me. You know, you're blessed and you're blessed of me. So to honor me, you, know, you do it by giving back a tenth of all that you have. You know, so the Bible, when he mentions this uh, in, in Deuteronomy, he says he's going to give first fruits. And I know for a series of times, sometimes people are confused, like, what is the first fruit, the tithe, or, you know, what's the first two fruits? Those two words are used uh, um, interchangeably in the, in the Bible. There's no differentiation between the first fruit and the tithe. You know, the tithe is the first fruit. You know, so he says, hey, bring it, and you'll see that he mentions first fruit in, the, in, like chap, in verse like 2, and then he says the tithe in verse you know, 13 and 12 and 13. So it's the same thing, the first fruit and the tithe. But you know, God wanted the Israelites to do this as a regular act of worship, you know, to return a tiny portion of what he's giving it to them as a way of honoring him um, and a regular reminder that he's a supplier. See, one of the things the tithe does, it reminds us who gave us our stuff. You, you know, that we didn't do it of our own um, strength, you know, which is really cool. So in this study, we're going to learn a couple of things. We're going to talk about, like, biblical principles to tithing as well as obstacles to tithing. And, now, and, and even how uh, um, giving is, a, is an act of worship for believers today, and it's rewarded, uh, um, which, is, which is really cool. So some historical background, the ancient, the ancient Israelites, right, they were what's called an agrarian society. Basically, they lived off the land, you know, the, the things that were in the earth. They, 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 they were farmers, you know, that, that's how they did their livelihood. There was no, like, money transfers and all those kind of things in that timeline. So they gave, they literally brought, like, you know, you had 10 flock or whatever, and you brought one. You had 10 of this, you brought one of it. And you just, you know, you gave a 10th portion, you brought it into the into the, the name where the Lord has put his, the place where the Lord has put his name, which is the storehouse or the, the, we call the church today. So literally the church would have to be a lot bigger than this just to hold a tenth of everybody's stuff. And then from the church, the church distributed and did different things. And this is not the distribution of wealth. You know, that's a whole political thing. This is about, you know, as believers and as God's people, we have a responsibility to take care of those without. So... You know, that's what was happening in that time. Uh, uh, um, they, they were giving, you know, this portion. And, that, that, you know, in verse 2, he talks about, he says, And you shall take some of, the, of all the first of the produce of the ground, which you um, shall bring from the land to, to the Lord, get, the Lord has given you, put it in baskets and bring it to the place where the Lord chooses to make his name abide. So sometimes there's a debate, well, I tithe, but I give it to um, children's place. Or I tithe and I give it to St. Jude's. You cannot tithe to a place that the Lord has not put his name. That's just called charitable giving. Is it a tax write-off? But the, the tithe goes to the place where the Lord has put his name. That's the household of God. We call it today the church. You know, secondly, you know, uh, um, this wasn't the first time that the tithe was mentioned. You know, the first time it appears in the Bible. We talked about it last week that, uh, um, you know, this happened 600 years prior to the law. Melchizedek, right, he shows up, and just to kind of recap, you know, um, Abram goes to battle, you know, to get Lot. He goes to what's called the Battle of the Kings. He wins the battle. He grabs the goods. He gets Lot back with him. And on his way back, he, Sodom, king of Sodom shows up, and Melchizedek so, shows up. He recognized that Melchizedek is Jesus. He worships him and gives him a tenth. You know, that's our Genesis uh, 14, 18 to 20. So when he returned from battle, he gave him a tithe of all. We looked at the name Melchizedek, and Melchizedek, just a random person that showed up in the scriptures before that, 
And we start studying through, last week we talked about, you know, his name is Melech Sadak, which means king of righteousness, and how we see that he was a typology of Jesus. We even went through to Hebrews um, 7, and it said that he was without father and mother, without genealogy, you know, um, which indicates he's like, uh, uh, um, you know, he has no beginning. He even said he has no beginning of end. He even said he was like the son of man, and he remains a priest forever. And we really dug into how this lines up directly with the description that the scriptures had of who Jesus was. And in verse 20 of um, 14, Genesis 14, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He was the first one to tithe. But he wasn't the only one. You know, Jacob, his grandson, later on ties. Jacob, you know, he decides he's going to go to a land called Padam Aram and uh, um, to find a wife. And, you know, he, he falls asleep and he has that stairway to heaven dream and he sees angels ascending and descending. And he, he wakes up and he says, man, I was in the place of the Lord and I didn't even know. You know, so that's Genesis 28. And when we look at 20, verse 20 to 22, it says, Jacob be, uh, made a vow saying, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I've set up as a, as a pillar will be the house of God. And all that you have given me, I will give you a tenth. See, as soon as he understand who God was, immediately his next form of worship was to tithe. The message of tithe is not to the non-believer, it's, it's to the believer. As soon as Abram recognized Melchizedek, he tithed. Jacob says, you will be my God, and I'm going to tithe. And this is all way before the law. You know, they were fully committed to this idea of worshiping the Lord with a tithe, and they didn't negotiate. You, you know, they didn't want like, well, you know, the tithe is like an Old Testament thing. <laughs> you know, they didn't was like, oh, God, you know, I'll give you 1% and work my way up to 10%. You know, they, they tithe, uh, I'll give you the net, not the gross. You, you know what I mean? They, they didn't really negotiate all that. They just tithe as a form of worship. You know, they're fully in. Even Jesus in the New Testament has conversations about this, right? So Jesus validates this principle of tithing, right? Matthew 23, 23. And Jesus, um, you know, he rebuked the Pharisees. For, you know, who are the Pharisees? Pharisees are, are, are a strict um, sect within Judaism. There's these religious leaders who prided themselves in their ability to follow the law. You, you know, so it's kind of like this Christian who says, I have not sinned, you know, you know, I do this, 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 I don't watch Netflix, I do this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they pride themselves. I watch Netflix, so, you know, Netflix is not sin. You know, if it is, I guess I am. Thank God I'm under the blood. So, you know, um, but they prided themselves in just not, you know, to doing everything as detailed as possible to the law. I mean, they even rebuked Jesus for healing people on the Sabbath, you know. Uh, it was all kinds of, that's who they were. And one of the things in the law that they pride themselves with their tithe. And so Jesus rebukes them here in, uh, um, in Matthew 23. He says, listen, you, 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 you've, uh, you, yeah, you did great with the tithe, but you rejected the more uh, uh, important matters of the law. Things like grace and mercy, excuse me, um, justice and mercy and faithfulness. He said, it's not that you should have stopped doing the former, but you should have done also the latter. So basically what Jesus said to them was, you don't stop tithing, you just do both. That's right. You know, you, you still do both of those things. You know, uh, um, Jesus also kind of mentions this idea of giving unto the Lord in um, Mark 12, and we can kind of go there real quick. Mark 12, verse 13 through 17, you know, he says, then they sent him um, some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. You know, so a lot of times they show up to Jesus to try to trick him up, you know. And they said, um, when they had come to him, teacher, we know that you are true. You know, that's that flattery. And you don't care about anybody, feeding the ego. You know, uh, um, for you do not regard a person of men, but you teach the way of God in truth. Well, we know that they don't really believe this because the scripture just said that they said all these things to catch him. You know, so they're trying to, like, you know, soup up, you know, like pump up Jesus, you know, so that he can operate incongruent with who he really is, right? So he says, um, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? You know, it's always a question. You know, we're like over 2,000 years later, we're trying to figure out how not to pay taxes, you know what I mean? So I understand what they're talking about. They say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? You know, um, shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he knew their hypocrisy. This proves again what their motivations were, right? He knew their hypocrisy and said to them, why do you test me? 
bring me a denarius, like bring me a, a dollar coin, you know, that I may see it. And they brought it to him. He said, whose um, image and inscription is in this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered to him and said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now, if this was only about taxes, Jesus would have stopped right there. Yep. Caesar's face was on there. Give it to Caesar's. You didn't ask me about anything else, you know, but he knew the motivation of their heart. So he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You know, so even Jesus addressed this idea of giving. He validated the principle of tithing. He didn't abandon it. So as we look at the Bible from cover to cover, there are some maybe like key points about tithing. You know, one is that tithing, um, you know, precedes the law, predicates the giving of the law, right? We know that it's codified in the law of Moses. You know, it was so good that God was like, hey, through Moses, let's put this thing in the law so my people will always be blessed. So it's, it's, it's written in the code of the law. We see here, as we just discussed, that it transcends the law in the New Testament, you know, as a reasonable um, act of worship. We know that tithing is not a legal obligation, just as our brother said earlier, you know, but it's a loving celebration of who God is and his goodness towards us, you know. You know, tithing is a reminder to our materialistic hearts that God is, is a supplier and he's the one who's in charge of everything. You know, it, it, he's the one who gives us the talents and the skills we have to even produce. You know, tithing reminds us of that. You know, tithing doesn't make us, you know, God doesn't like make us wealthy to increase our standard of living per se, but he does it to increase our standard of giving. See, the more that I have, a, a tithe of a million is bigger than a tithe of a dollar. The principle's the same, right? But uh, you can't do as much as you can with 100000 as you can do with $0.10. Cents. So it, it, it's, you know, he increases our, our component to be able to give more. The challenge is we don't understand um, that God owns everything, and we're just stewards of everything. We fall into the money challenge. You know, money begins to dominate our life because we don't understand who it is, and he starts strangling us and put us in bondage. There's a quote I like that, you know, I've heard many times. I can't tell you who said it. He says that, uh, um, you know, money makes a wonderful servant, or a horrible master, you, you, you know. Uh, um, so to be under the grip of money is a horrible thing. A gentleman Randy Alcorn um, in his book, The Treasure Principle, asks this challenging question. He says, does it make sense that God would expect from those of us who are in the wealthiest nation in the face of the earth less than he would expect from the poorest Israelites? Think about that. Like, our poor people have iPhones. You, you know what I mean? And these guys were coming out of slavery, and he said, hey, tithe. Would he expect less from us than he would from them? You know? So it's kind of interesting thing. Proverbs says to honor the Lord with your wealth. Proverbs 3 and 9. You know, Proverbs 3 and 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 says, now about the collection of, of, um, for God's people, you know, on the, on the first day of every week, right, um, each one who set aside a sum of money to keep with his income. Basically, he says, the portion in which you set aside is in correlation with how much you earn. You, you know, and that makes sense, right? The 10% stays. You know, it's not like, hey, the wealthy needs to give 50% and the poor gives 5%. It's 10% across the board. The, you know, so according to the, to, to, uh, in keeping with his income, it says, you know, Matthew 6 and 21, he says, where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. That's an easy scripture to kind of quote. Yeah, where treasure is, your heart is also. But when you start considering our lives, Many of us, if you ask people, like, what are things they value? Oh, my family, my relationship with the Lord, you know, this, this, this. And we have this list of things that we value. But they say if you want to really see what a person values, you look at two things. One is their calendar, and second is their checkbook. Right? Where do you put your time? Where do you put your money? And you can see what you really value, you know. And I know for me, many a times I looked at those two and I was convicted, you know, because I was like, man. I said I value my time, but I'm always at work. Excuse me, I value my family, but I'm always at work, you know, you, or, or something like that. So you have to look, and how do I use those two resources? Because all of your life, all of the things that happen in your life are going to be a combination of your time and money. You know, it's like, why don't you do this? Either lack of time or lack of money, or why are you able to do it? Because you have the time and you have the resources, you know. So he says, that's your treasure, you know. Um, but wherever your heart is, so will your treasure be also. You know, there are approximately 2,350 verses, so 2,350 verses in the Bible concerning money. You know, 
which is um, twice as many as they are about faith and prayer combined. This is an important topic, right? You know, um, Jesus spoke um, more about the stewardship of money than he did about heaven and hell combined. Of his 38 parables, 16 of them had something to do with money or a stewardship of money. You, you know, so the Bible has a lot to say about, you know, um, how we, this topic of stewardship or finances or money specifically, as a direct correlation to how we manage our relationship with God and how our heart is towards him. You know, and so... I know here that there's many people who are cheerful givers, you know, um, but for those who don't understand this, like, first fruit thing or uh, um, tithe or tenth, I'm going to explain it very clearly, right? In the scriptures, uh, um, this, this group of Israelites, right, they're in a agrarian society, as we talked about. They brought a tenth of, of their, 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 their flock and their meat and their chicken and whatever else they had back then, you know, all their cinnamon and spices. They gave a tenth of all that. Today... We go to work, and we collect a paycheck. So a tenth is, if you tell somebody you make $50,000 a year, a tenth is $5,000. You know, when you look at the top of your paycheck, there's like this net and gross, and sometimes you like the gross is gross, but it doesn't really matter. You know, whatever the gross is, is 10% of that. It's really simple. It's just 10%. You, you know, and that's, that, that's what it is, a simple thing. Understand here that I'm not talking to several people in the room. I'm not talking to the non-believer, you know. I'm not talking to someone who's visiting here today. I'm not speaking to, um, you know, someone who, you know, maybe doesn't have a relationship with the Lord. I know I said non-believer earlier. Uh, um, someone who's not a regular attender. Who I'm speaking to is the people who get fed out of the house. Yes, sir. The people who are regular attenders, the people whose lives have been enriched through the word that they received from this house. That's who we're talking to. Those are the people who tithe, and they bring their tithe to the storehouse, a place where the Lord has put his name. You know, it's a really, really important thing. And that happens, you know, um, in today's 2022 world, physically and digitally. You know, where people may plug into a church and they say, man, I, I, I get the word there. My life is enriched there. And they give there. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it, God doesn't say you have to give it to X church. He says you have to go to give it to a place where his, uh, his name is, the place where you're being fed. So that's the simplicity of the tithe. No one should be under a bondage for that. If you're visiting for the first time, they do tithes and offering. You shouldn't start sweating. You, you know what I mean? Um, I personally have a dream of one day that, you know, there's just baskets at the front. And just as you come in, because the Christians already know that this is the place they get fed, they just give their tithe and we just continue going with the service. You know what I mean? How cool would that be? You know what I mean? Because we have that revelation of who Christ is to us. You know, so, but I do think that people, um, <clears throat> you know, um, I think that people overall like to give, both believers and non-believers. You know, yesterday I'm going to Redner's and, you know, I see, I don't know what they're doing, some cheerleading, dancing thing, and, you know, and they're asking for cookies, and I didn't want to buy their cookies, so I just gave them some money, and it felt good. You know what I mean? You, you, you see the Girl Scouts, and you give them something, you see good. Someone's GoFundMe, and you give it to them, and see it's good. You see that picture, like the African kid with the pot belly and the little fly, you know, the thing right here, and you give, you know, and you feel good about it. You know, so we naturally like to, to give, to, I haven't seen that picture. Oh, okay, cool. You know, I saw some people looking at me like, I'm like, you've seen that commercial. You were up late. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but it feels good to give, you know. And that's whether you're a believer or not believer. Uh, um, so why don't more Christians give or get to engage in this generosity um, that they may want to? And a lot of times because they're strangled by debt and being over leveraged. Here's some interesting stats. They're from the Federal Reserve Bank Household Debt and Credit Report. It shows that the, um, an increase in total household debt in the second quarter of 2022, so that's as of June 2022, increased by $312 billion. That's a 2% increase up to now $16.5 trillion. Balances um, stand two to three trillion dollars higher now of debt than they did at the end of 2019 um, before COVID pandemic. The average um, debt per household is $163,248. The average credit card debt is um, $5,944. People with more education actually carry a little bit more balances on their credit card debt, up to an average $7,900. Auto loans are averaging right now $29,040. Student loans are averaging $59,133. 
you know. Harris Poll um, did a post, and the survey found that Americans who received pandemic relief in March of 2020 or since then, 22% of those people use it to pay off debt or pay down on the debt they had, the credit card debt, which explains why it's only $5,900 is the average debt, you know. Uh, um, is this because they use it to pay off some? We know the cost of living has increased over the last um, recent years. The median household income has fell 3%. You know, at the same time, the cost of living has gone up 7%. That means that people have a 10% differential that they're not able to operate at as they were able to before, you, you know, um, in there. More than a third of Americans, about 35%, say that their household financial situation has gotten worse over the past 12 months, according to the survey. You know, a group of 38% uh, say that it's because they had a decrease in their household income, and 36% says because the cost of living has increased. We've all seen it. This is not like, oh, you know, we've all went to the gas pumps and it was two dollars or something in January, and, and, and it was four, almost five dollars, and now we're like, oh, it's only three eighty-seven. You know what I mean? But still, <laughs> fifty percent greater than it was in the beginning of the year. You, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was kind of interesting. Uh, the, the sad thing is that U.S. households who carry credit card debt pay uh, um, in interest charges on average this year a thousand twenty-nine dollars just in interest charges. The, you know. So this means that many people, many Christians are living on money that they don't already have, you know, um, which leads to less giving. You know, and the sad part is as Christians, we've created a culture that celebrates debt. We do. We take our kids and we say, hey, listen, man, you know, to go to school, get a good education, get a good job. This is not Evans's anti-education thing, right? But just listen, this is what we do, right? And we celebrate the fact that, oh, you went and got this degree and this degree and this degree which many a times wasn't a scholarship, wasn't any of those kind of things. We sent them all across the world to get this degree, which equates to massive amount of debt. Remember, $56,000. The average bachelor's degree does not compensate today similar to how it would have when I would have graduated almost 20 years ago, oh, over 20 years, about 20 years ago. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So, so, so it, it, it's costing you more and it's compensating you less, and we go, yay! then as soon as you come out with that 50 grand of debt, you can't drive the same car that you drove in high school because that's a beater. You need something that's going to last you a long time. So you go and you get a $30,000 loan, and we go, yay! We take pictures and go, God bless me with this debt. And then as soon as you've um, been working for about two or three years, you get, you know, you can't be renting. You're just throwing money in the wind. You know, you're not building any equity. You know, so we say you need to go get mortgage. Well, the word mortgage is two words. Old French and then mort, the, the, the mort part goes actually all the way to Latin, and the words mean death pledge. So you go get a death pledge, and we go, yay, look at the keys to my death pledge. If you want to see who owns the home, mystery payments. You, you know what I mean? So, 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 so I'm not saying don't get a house. I'm not saying don't go to school. I'm not saying don't get a vehicle, but maybe operate within our means. But because we're over leveraged, we restrict our giving. Because we say God bless us with this hundred and sixty, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar, I mean, house debt situation, we don't give to the God that blessed us because we gotta pay the bill now. You, you know? This is a challenge on why giving has decreased across, you know, Christianity. Because we're not teaching principles that are in line with God. The average person doesn't even stay in their home for 15 years. So, you know, you are throwing it in the wind. The average person doesn't pay off their home. They get a second and third and they get a consoli uh, debt consolidation deal and they do all this kind of stuff. So they're not building equity. You build equity if you're going to sell it. It's an asset to the bank. It's not an asset to you. you unless you're receiving positive income on it, it's a liability. But we don't teach these things. We celebrate all this stuff, you, you know, and we're not able to worship and give to our God. That's just what's going on today. You know, basic finances. And promise you, if I live by these basic finances, my financial plan would kill me. But basic finances is that you should give 10%, you should save 10%, and you should live on the rest. You know, that's basic. If you can't afford to pay for your mortgage out a week, a week and a half, the house is too big. But we don't teach those kind of things because we need to look good. We need to have this big old house. And, and I'm not anti-big houses. I'm just saying according to the measure 
that you're able to so that when the economy shifts, when a recession right now, you're not strangled. You know, so that's me off my little soapbox there. But it's a passion point, uh, um, and it's an important thing. You know, uh, um, this lack of generosity is due to poor money management. You know, because Christians simply have um, a day-to-day -day lifestyle that exceeds their standard of, li of, of living, they're, they're neglected that joy of being able to um, give and receive that blessing in there. They literally have robbed God. In 1 Chronicles 29, the, first, the second part of 14 and then 16, he says, everything comes from you. And we've given to you only those what we have in our hand, uh, what, is, what is from our hand. O Lord God, as for all this abundance we have is providing for a building for the temple of your holy name, it has come to your hands and it all belongs to you. Come to our hand and it all belongs to you. Everything we have has come from the Lord's hand, all belongs to him. It's not about like a building per se, you're giving to the church, it's just that through the building is where the ministry of God flows. It, it, you know, um, so if we look back at Deuteronomy around um, 26, 13, uh, excuse me, verse 12 here, it says, when you finish and set aside all the tithe for the increase um, of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and you've given it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, that they may eat within your gates and be filled. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but that's the idea is that we, we've given, and so that giving can now flow through the building of God. Those who serve in the house of God are considered the Levites. So that's who those are. You know, so you go, who are the Levites? Those who serve in the house of God. You know, you know, they make their living through helping and ministering to people, to those who are poor and disadvantaged, that they can help. You know? And since we have a strong consumer-oriented um, culture, you know, it's hard sometimes to come to church and realize that it's not about us. You, you know, we come sometimes about my problem and my week and my this, but it's really about God and his kingdom, you, you know. So as Christians, we need to come to the Lord and we need to give, you know, we give of our time in serving him, you know, and helping. You know, we give our money in, in providing. We give our voice in worship, you know. You know, so ministry should flow through the house of God. You know, and this is, you know, for the poor, for uh, um, the homeless, for those who are challenged. Just to kind of give you an idea that we believe in this as Crossroad Christian Church, over the last two years, so since 2019, we've given $295,000 to support feeding the hungry, to the, the support homeless, to support widows, to support people in our community, and, and, and making him known, um, and, 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 or knowing him and making him known. So we've given $295,000 to our community um, in the last two years. That's kind of cool. And I say we because you guys are part of the we. Your 10% your matters um, to providing support to the community, and that's how we use it, um, which is pretty cool. So some quick principles of tithing. You know, um, tithing begins with, of course, bringing into the house of God, the place where his word, um, the word of God is ministered to you. It's a tenth of your income as an act of worship. And it can be done weekly, monthly, annually. It doesn't really matter. You know, um, it says set aside on the first day here you, as far as the law is concerned. But because of the principle of worship, you can give the tithe whenever you use tithes. You know, you shouldn't feel bad. I get paid monthly. Like, how do I do it? You know, you just, whenever you get paid, you give, you know. According to Deuteronomy um, 23, I mean 26, 2 to 3, and then 9 through 10, it says tithing is a reminder that everything we have comes from God. You know, verse 11, 26, verse 11, tithing is, um, is rejoicing over God's goodness. It says, and you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the good things that the Lord has given you and your household. So tithing helps us in that rejoicing. Um, 26, verse 15, I know we didn't read through there. It shows that tithing is, a re is rewarded by God. It says, look down from heaven your holy dwelling place, and bless your people Israel and the land that you've given us as you have promised as an oath to your fathers, the land flowing with milk and honey. Malachi 3.10, you know, on um, the second part, he says, now test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not um, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour down such a blessing that you don't have enough to re receive it. Tithing is rewarded by God. You know, 2 um, Corinthians 8, you know, and 7, even teaches us that you know, if we're going to excel in anything, we should excel also in our giving. So 2 Corinthians 8 and 7 says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, 
and speech and knowledge in complete earnestness in, um, in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. See, God wants us to grow in our grace of giving. And, and so as Moses is setting up the people, prepare for them to go into the promised land, he wants them to recognize a couple things. It's our God who supplies all our needs. He supplies his needs as a, as a portion of his love and extension of love towards you. And through that, he wants you to show as a form of worship that you could give it 10%. And as you give that 10%, it's rewarded. It's a form of rejoicing, and your increase will come out of that. I pray that today as you receive this message, it lands on good hearts, and, and you know that God does love you. You know that he has set aside for you. He supplied everything to get you to this moment in your life. You know that you're not under, um, under like a, a prison or, or anything concerning your giving, but I want you to continue to lean in. If you're not understanding or getting this whole concept, just continue to get Jesus. Because tithing is not a mandate of the law. You, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's a revelation of your heart. But it's a principle that we follow as believers and allows us to continue to rejoice in our work in Jesus.